Hello, I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society. Welcome to the Urban Agenda. Our topic is the current mayoral campaign as Fernando Ferrer seeks to deny Mayor Bloomberg a second term. Joining me today is veteran Democratic political strategist Hank Shankoff, whose firm has served as political, public affairs, and corporate media consultants for more than 25 years. And as uh, I've said, I've known Hank for more than that. Time. And lucky for me. Right. Uh, Hank, uh, I think we just finished a survey, actually, of low-income uh, New Yorkers, Lake Schnell and Perry, one of the polling mm -hmm. firms, did it. Um, the largest, actually, poll of low-income people, apparently, going on in the country at this point. And one of the things we were shocked with was a dramatic uh, drop in sort of the certainty that many people want to go to participate in this election. Um, they're all, you know, at or just above the poverty line. They got a lot of trouble, 65 percent saying the city's going in the wrong direction. What's going on as, as far as you view it in the electorate at this point? Well, David, New Yorkers, like all people around the country in their individual uh, political and geographic areas, have an internal time clock. They know when elections are, and they kind sure. of view New York mayor elections as not a four-year term, but an eight-year term. Right. Why do we say that? Well, in our lifetimes, and we're going to date ourselves now. Let's see. Um, who's had one term? Uh, Wagner had three terms, and Pelletieri and O'Dwyer don't count because that was a it was a series of corruption and leaving and who knows what. Right. Uh, Lindsay had two terms. Right. Beam had one term, but there was a disaster. Yeah. Okay. Koch had three terms. Dinkins had one term. Giuliani had two terms. And Bloomberg has now had one. Right. It tells you something. People view it as one term of eight years, and only an extraordinary set of circumstances can change that. And that's part of the problem. So they don't really think that they can make much difference in the vote. The other thing we note is that when people identify themselves as more poor than not, right. the probabilities of their turnout also declines. And that is instructive from the survey. Well, let's talk about it. I mean, some commentators have said this particular mayoral race is already a foregone conclusion. Why even bother coming? I, I've seen some newspapers that seem to indicate that. You know, double-digit spreads between uh, Bloomberg and his challenger. Do you think this is a race at all? Is, this, is there a race going on here? Uh, the, the calling of this race is a double-digit conclusion today, six weeks out, is absolute nonsense. Right. If you do the arithmetic and you think about New York politics as both tribal neighborhood, ethnic, and uh, social class based. If you come up with a different view on this, I think, if you take 80% of the Hispanic vote, which Freddie Ferrer of the Bronx will get, you take 60% of the blacks, which is not an unreasonable number, and 20% of the whites, guess what? Ferrer starts out with a base of 46, 47%. That's not a, that's not a big stretch. The way this thing is going, you can comfortably say, and you know, two weeks from now it might change dramatically, but. This is a three to five point race, six points maybe. It's 50 to 75,000 votes either way, which is not a tremendous number of votes. And the determination of who wins will be, will be finally um, figured out by who turns out. That's the difference. Well, let's talk about turnout. I mean, uh, is uh, Ferrer's base of Latinos and to a lesser extent African Americans going to be fired up uh, with the sort of messages he's pre presenting? Well, the question becomes, can he do what he did in 2001 by creating a 26 percent Latin base? The answer is probably not, for different reasons. If you look at the history of politics in this city um, and the conflicts and coalitions between blacks and Latins, you come up with some, some interesting observations, I think. In 2001, there had not been a Hispanic or Latino standard bearer since 1973, and That's I was Herman. at that shootout with mm -hmm. Herman Badillo in 1973, yep. which is an awfully long time ago, number one. Number two, this group that had been denied and people in a tribal context, which New York City politics are all about, like to see one of their own. They turned out with intensity. There was another specter looming over the horizon that, that changed the dynamic as well in 2001. Even though he could not run for re-election, Rudy Giuliani was there. And if you recall on September 10th, hmm. uh, his numbers were probably in the 42 to 48 range on a re-elect, which meant he would have been right. ridden out of town on a rail. September 11th, unfortunately for the tragedy, reified him and recreated him as a, uh, as a, as a sympathetic and leader-style a public figure, which we may agree or disagree on, but that's what occurred. Right. Different dynamic today. Bloomberg um, has been blessed, for whatever reason, um, with a four-year term having no racial incidents of consequence, okay? Um, some job creation, mm -hmm. um, relative anyway. peace and calm, and a management style that people have adjusted to. 
he is not the raucous mayor going back to LaGuardia who seems to be in total control all over the place. Although he is in total control, but he's not all over the place. He's mm -hmm. not bombastic. He's not, he doesn't have Ed Koch's humor, nor sarcasm, nor Rudy's toughness. Mm -hmm. He just is very direct. And that's a management style New Yorkers had to get adjusted to because it's not something they're used to. Right? But they have. That accounts for the increase in favorables, plus the amount of television available. He's, produ he's produced and bought immense amounts of television media. And we know going back to the early 80s and studies done by uh, political scientists, uh, Patterson was one, that 81% uh, in those years of the population tended to get most of their political information from television. Is there a point of diminishing returns? I mean, I assume the mayor is going to buy up enormous blocks, right. or already has, yeah. really, of the media. Does it come to a point from your history? You've done national campaigns, local sure. campaigns. Is there a point of diminishing returns where the public becomes so inundated with the message that it really doesn't move them anymore? There is a point of diminishing returns, but it depends entirely on what the other side is doing. Right. If the other side uh, acts in an inappropriate fashion or becomes negative, then the diminishing returns argument doesn't work. If the other side flattens out, what happens is uh, you put up a lot, enough stuff, there's diminishing returns, and the turnout flattens. A different set of issues. Well, Neg negatives tend to reduce turnout, by the way, not increase. Not increase it. Well, if you were representing Freddie Ferrer in this campaign, what would you be urging uh, him to do now well, as a com political consultant? Hmm, let me rub my head there. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Free, um, free, free advice. There is no, there is no question in my mind, but that he can win this race at this point. Mm -hmm. This is not uh, over by any stretch of the imagination. It's a long time. This to is go. not Ruth Messenger versus Giuliani. Now she got a bad break, too. It's yeah. called Al Sharpton yeah. and the runoff, which, which didn't happen, but which really created tremendous uh, um, doubts about Democrats' ability to govern right. more than anything else because of the raucousness of the, of the discussion post the primary. But um, his first problem is to find a message that works. And the mm -hmm. message they have is just not working. It's not strong enough. It probably is effective in one quadrant of the electorate, notably Latinos, because he's Latino, and there's a desire to see one of your own. And sure. Jews did it, blacks did yep. it. It's part of the history. I mean, there wasn't a Jewish mayor until A. Beam. Put it right. in context. There were two million Jews living here in 1950. I mean, put right. it in context. Uh, Italian Americans had theirs. Uh, um, mm -hmm. LaGuardia, uh, wasps, which we don't have a lot of, had theirs. It was called John Lindsay. Jews had right. Beam and then Koch. Uh, uh, ethics in the outer boroughs kind of um, imprinted their own set of values mm -hmm. and um, and sense of uh, ethnicity. And Rudy Giuliani kind of seen as every angry man in response to right. crisis. Um, Freddie has not created that urgency, nor has he created a message that propels people to want to drop everything they're doing and pant hysterically until they can get to the polling places. That's number one. The social class argument that he is attempting to use does not have the legs that social class arguments in the past have had because Bloomberg has calmed down the environment. If you had racial incidents, you would have greater social class activity. You don't have that. Yeah. Um, where is Bloomberg vulnerable? Potentially in education, but I, I must say the Bloomberg campaign has done an extraordinarily good job of reducing the attacks on that argument. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other problem is that Ferrer's uh, incessant flubs, of which there have been several now, right. have reduced emotional attachment to him, notably among the black community. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, ha not, not, not having been black all my life, but certainly white, and knowing a lot of black people well and having talked to them about this. Right. The emotional pain of what the Diallo case represented in real terms, you know, reminded everybody that the greatest crime during the Giuliani years was probably driving while black. Right. I mean, all of that brought up again, and for Freer not to understand that. And to back, try to back away from a position that was he had credibly taken before. Which, in fact, may reduce black turnouts for Freddie. May not increase turnouts for, for Bloomberg, Bloomberg, but will certainly reduce black turnouts to some extent for Freddie, because that's a hard, it's kind of like a hard tide to roll over. Right. Now, we've seen a lot of national uh, Democratic figures coming in to try sure. to bolster the Ferrer campaign. Is that going to have any uh, impact? Certainly some Democrats will be impacted by it. But the targets um, that he needs to hold on to, which are 20 percent of the whites and plus, right. and a larger portion of the African-American community, are probably not going to be highly motivated. There's no urgency because if he can bring in whoever he wants. But what we know about our politics is that there is a reduction generally of party identification and that people vote based upon character of the individual they see in front of them. They're One of the things that would actually support an earlier statement you made, uh, in our survey results that are just coming out, uh, we found that when people were asked what was the chief thing that was holding them back, it really was about skills. They felt that if they had the skills, they could go like a, a bat out of hell.
Mm -hmm. And I think that really sort of gets into a different class. They don't see themselves as poor. They see themselves basically as, as trying to acquire needed skills so they and their family can shoot ahead in the economy. No question which about is that. Which is clearly a change going on below the, below the surface. But that is a credit to the Clinton years. Right. Um, because Clinton in his, and I was a member of the Clinton media team in 95 and 96, uh, Clinton clearly talked about providing people with the opportunities to get those skills, that there, was, that there was an opportunity argument. Right. What Bloomberg has to keep pounding on, I think, is the notion of opportunity. What Ferrer ought to be pounding on is the notion of opportunity in an emotional context, but he can't seem to get there because he's stuck in normative democratic discussion. It mm -hmm. doesn't work. It doesn't work. And if it worked, we'd have Democrats in the White House, we'd have Democrats in the Senate and in major numbers and Democrats in the House. Democrats are in a significantly difficult position. Nationally, locally, it doesn't matter. When they defend the New Deal, they're in great shape. People will elect, but the New Deal's over 70 years. Yes. That's why they won the Social Security argument. Right. When they try to defend anything else, it doesn't work because people don't define themselves as poor in that sense anymore of being completely desolate. In fact, right. they, want, they believe that there is opportunity because Clinton told them with millions, with thousands of gross rating points of television that in fact, you can have opportunity. Mm -hmm. What they want from public officials is to get opportunity, different argument. We'll be right back to continue the urban agenda. Yes, you are. Come here. Let's see how this looks. Hey, mm -hmm. how's my little horse? She's a lion. Yes, she is. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. When you adopt a child from foster care, just being there makes all the difference. Welcome to the Urban Agenda. We're discussing the current mayoral campaign in New York City with political strategist Hank Schenkel. Hank, I, you know, much of uh, the Democratic uh, discussion has been around everyone's trying to do like Clinton did, uh, run to the center, run to the right, you know, mm -hmm. forget about core constituencies. Um, is that what really uh, is happening? Does, why isn't that seeming to work here? I mean, some of the us have uh, seen, obviously, uh, Freddie's campaign trying to go towards the center, and it doesn't seem to be getting traction either. It's, it, that's not what Clinton was about. Clintonism wasn't about running to the center. Right. The Clinton campaign of 1995 and 1996, which defined our democratic politics going forward, and still is, was about taking the value arguments away from the Republicans and putting them in a democratic context. That if you fought crime, you gave people opportunity because you protected neighborhoods mm -hmm. and you created safety. Okay, that if you, uh, if you fought against the cutting uh, Medicare and, and Medicaid, Medicare, in particular the national context, you were protecting our values of, of, of protecting our parents. Right. If, you fought, if you fought against education cuts, you weren't just sticking money in people's pockets, you were making sure that everybody had opportunity. That's the difference. So what they've done is, and the Democrats in Washington have done this badly, and that's one of the reasons they're in trouble, is that they've taken the Clinton idea and somehow said, without intellectually th parsing it and saying, let's just run to the right. That's not what this is about. This is ultimately about values, because if religion and region are the dominating forces in American politics nationally today, mm -hmm. which they are, then one has an obligation to understand that and to take religious argumentation, which is about fairness, decency, integrity, and put it into play, which is what the Clinton stuff was about. We have a, a, a little, actually, vignette about that that we, we are still reeling from. My assumption coming out of as a black kid in the 50s that uh, to talk about technical and vocational education was off the, the radar screen. That was where you tracked, you know. I, re I remember being in high school and asked what trade I was going to do. And no, I, was, I was told that yeah. I was not college material, that right. I should go in the service or get, yeah. the, uh, get a trade. And see, we, maybe we proved them right. Yeah. <laughs> we would, they probably sure. were right. You know? <laughs> we would have done it Depends who you talk to, I guess. Yeah, but I, I think uh, we were just, uh, because of the incredibly high failure rate of kids in the city's high schools, right? we have 23 high schools that have no, no graduates no. whatsoever, and more than 50% of blacks and Latinos never graduate with any right. kind of degree. So it's, it's appalling. It's a disgrace. But it, it tracks across the nation. You know, I began to wonder if, even as we talk about educational reform, what are we going to do for the two-thirds that we've already ill-served? And I thought this was going to be a hot button issue. Um, we asked it in our 04 poll. Sure. 89% of the respondents said they'd like to see that as a major priority in the schools. And nearly 80% who had kids in the schools wanted it for their kid. 
And that was a paradigm shift that if such a question had been asked of my parents and grandparents, of another gen would have been totally off the table. Well, it's tangibility, by the way, and I think right. what, what's going on here is that the same way we have inculcated, just, and this is not my area of expertise, certainly, but just as we've inculcated people the need for graduate education, for right. specialization, because yeah. it's a tangible, therefore people coming into undergraduate or high school education won't have something tangible that they can make a living, living with. with. That's right. real serious. One of the things that I think we're, we're, we're picking up on that we've discussed is the incredible demographic change that's going on in the city of New York. I mean, we were sure. clearly picking up um, enormous numbers of uh, new poor, Asian, you know, uh, Central Americans, all sorts of stuff have gone on under the surface right. here. How does that play against the political context of, of this, this uh, election that we're in? Significantly. I mean, if you just go back 20 years, Dave Dinkins created a miracle. That was 15, 16 years yeah. ago. Bill Lynch, and Bill Lynch ran a spectacular campaign. They did a great job. They won. Dinkins became the symbol of what you could do. Right. Okay. And I don't want to get into the administration. That's, yeah. that's controversial sufficiently. But the city has changed so dramatically in just those 15 years. I mean, 20 years ago, 50 percent of the population of Queens were Jews. Today, it's 15 percent and dropping rapidly. The per capita, highest per capita income in Queens County, as a case example, is not in the white community, it's in the black community. Southeast Queens is sure. a tremendous high per capita income and growing and extraordinarily touching and wonderful things are happening. Mm -hmm. um, Brooklyn has become a, a uh, if you look at voting numbers, let's see, I guess it's probably about, uh, my bet, 37 percent in voting numbers, black, probably about 30 to 30, 33, 34 Jews, mostly Orthodox today, right. and then there's everybody else. Catholic numbers are dropping. Yeah. Uh, Queens has Pretty good base of 25 percent Catholics overall, um, but not the blue collar white working class. And the interesting thing in this election, I think, is what we find is finally the death of the world in which I came from, which is the out of borough blue collar white working class. That's over. It's over because people can't afford to live here anymore, frankly. And they can't afford, once they got their kids done, they're out of here. So with that shift, obviously, we're talking about ethnic votes that are going to be totally different sure. in the, in, both in this election and forthcoming Well, East Harlem is another classic. Mexicans. Right. Puerto Ricans are being displaced by Mexicans. Puerto Ricans, to a, to a large, to, a, to, a, to some extent, have gone up the economic ladder. Mm -hmm. Dominicans are amazing people. I've, I've worked in, in, you know, in two campaigns in the Dominican Republic. I, I'm impressed by that, that whole community. I mean, as soon as they get a couple of bucks, they buy a piece of land. Right. They do amazing things, and they're trying to get out of poverty that way. But the notion of who is poor and where they come from is entirely different. Mm -hmm. And the cultures from which they come and the expectations from government are entirely different. Right. I, we, different. we had this debate within the African-American community. I remember when my father was running 30, 40 years ago, the difficulty was raising any kind of money from within the community. Uh, now, for the first time, I'm seeing the ability of many of these communities and others, Dominicans the rest, they can basically raise campaign money if they have the right message from their own little constituency. And that was something that was totally off the chart. I mean, if there is, and this is, this is as, a, as, a, as a white American and certainly as a, as a New Yorker, and we are a separate place from the rest of this country, if there is something to be grateful for, it is to be gra in gratitude for Clinton economics that forced, that, that, took, that took advantage of existing law and situation, nothing mm -hmm. else. Clinton economics changed everything. The burgeoning black middle class, which is a real thing in this town. Right. I mean, it's extraordinary. And in that context, where there is not that conflict, where poor people are no longer the, one, the poor people we knew of yesteryear, yep. then the, the, the ability for people to create a backlash against the mayor in a city where people view the eight-term period as really one term is right. very, very difficult. Well, how much is also the, the wish for stability? I mean, uh, clearly I hear from many of the people I talk to, no, we're not particularly enthusiastic or Bloomberg, but we, we, we don't want to deal with something untried. Let's not blow people's brains out, but let's say the following is a fact. 98% of incumbents are returned to office nationally. 98%, which means you got a 2% shot. How often is a mayor defeated? That's one of the problems Freddie Freer faces. And the second problem he faces is what's the great urgency? What is the urgency? You can't say that Mike Bloomberg's a crook. You can't say he's, a, he's, he's not a reformer of some kind. You can't say he belongs to the political machines. And by the way, even those arguments don't work. Although you do have situations where they do work, depending upon turnouts and, and, and political politics at the moment, but by and large they don't work. Look at machine domination of politics in this city. It's been pretty consistent. Right. And let's talk, I, I guess this election will come out, we talked about it earlier in terms of a turnout one. Sure. And the question is, 
do you see any signs from the work you're being, you've been doing in the city that the Latino community is going to come out with passion uh, for this election? I think they're going to come out. I think that, that in total numbers, they're going to certainly, I, I would be, wouldn't be surprised, I would be surprised if, if Fernando Ferrer of the Bronx did not get at least 80% of that vote. Right. The problem and the ultimate deciders here and the, what the outcomes will be are African Americans. Mm -hmm. Do they come out with intensity? Because with a nine, nine to one ratio of voting Democratic and they are the most loyal portions yes. of the Democratic Party electorate, most loyal and um, the and, least and paid most, attention to and the most, the most, the most, the most, the most loyal, the most sophisticated in many right. ways because not voting is an act as good as voting. Yes. I mean, I, I feel strongly about this and my own experience of 35 years teaches me right. this. but. Um, if they come out in large numbers, they're not coming out to vote for Mike Bloomberg. The question is, do they turn out? And do they want to turn out for Fernando Freer? That is yet to be revealed. And when do you think we'll get the parameters of that? How close to the election? I, people two weeks out. Two weeks out, we'll know. Two weeks out. Because no, people don't, voting, uh, contrary to what, the, uh, what some of the theorists would tell us, voting is not an intellectual exercise. Uh, we make it too difficult in this country. Right. Um, much too difficult. It is an emotional response to a set of circumstances. If you're emotionally motivated, you get there. If you're not, you tend not to. If you believe the incumbent's going to win anyway, it doesn't matter, you probably don't. Let's talk about something that, that obviously uh, messed up uh, Dinkins' second run, which was the, uh, you know, essentially the unions seem to go elsewhere. Uh, the unions seem to be, by and large, lining up with Freddie. Mm -hmm. um, are they going to be a major factor in this election? Unions are important in that they have mechanisms in which to move a vote out and to educate their members and to right. do certain things. What are they educating their members about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the great argument against Bloomberg? We have not yet heard that. We haven't heard the great argument for Fernando Ferrer, the emotional argument that stirs the passions, that reminds us of yesteryear when people would scream and yell and jump up and down. I mean, that's the other thing. Nobody's jumping up and I down. Know. I've never seen an election like this in all my life in New York. Frank Barber runs against Koch in 81, he's screaming and yelling. Nobody's screaming and yelling here. There's no passion, there's no, there's no theater, there's no carnival style atmosphere. We don't have the unions jumping up and down. It is a, it is somewhat, it's, it's a, that's almost a passive response to power. Mm -hmm. Now anybody who runs against power gets 30% of the vote. My betting is that this is again a six to eight point, six, five, uh, my betting three to six in that ballpark race and, and, and it can go either way. But where's the passion? Can the unions turn out a vote? Dennis Rivera is an extraordinarily adept, smart, passionate, um, and good man. He really is, and, mm -hmm. and he's, he's, he's just, he has a mystical quality about him. I'm a big fan, um, and I think he's done great for the city and, and been, been helpful both in protecting jobs and protecting health care. Is he going to turn the vote out? People got to be interested first. Mm -hmm. He'll do the best he can, and he'll do a great job. The teachers' union. Um, who knows? I mean, the lieutenant, police lieutenants uh, this week endorsed, uh, this past week endorsed uh, uh, Bloomberg. Right. They don't live in New York City. It doesn't help them. doesn't help. So who knows? My thanks to Democratic political strategist Hank Shankoff. I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society. And thank you for watching The Urban Agenda. To learn more about the work of the Community Service Society of New York or to comment on the Urban Agenda, please contact us at 212-614-5425 and on the web at www.cssny.org.